Laser cut wooden terrain kits are great. They're cheap, they're easy to build, but when they're finished, they do tend to look like a bunch of pieces of wood glued together. So I'm gonna show you how I take something like this and turn it into something that looks a bit less like a Puzz 3D. There are two immutable rules with MDF terrain kits, seal the surface and fill the gaps, in that order. Sorry to get all technical, but MDF is a thirsty, thirsty fibre board. It'll drink in your paint faster than Uncle Dave on a work outing. And just like Uncle Dave, this causes the fibres to swell and the surface becomes all fuzzy. You can buy specialist MDF sealers, but I find watered down PVA glue or Mod Podge work just as well for this. And the good news is you really don't have to be all that careful with it. You can just slap it on and let the thirst consume it. I'm not going to overly labour the point, but the biggest thing you can do to make MDF terrain look decent is fill the edges. Cheap domestic fillers fine, as long as you've sealed the ends first. And once it's sanded, I like to seal it again to try and mitigate that whole escape artist thing it likes to do. To get away from the pop-up book aesthetic, it helps to add some three-dimensionality to the individual parts. In the case of this power station model, that means adding countless raised panels, as well as recessing the doorways and windows and adding frames. In essence, I'm either adding or removing material to create more depth, dimension, and things that cast shadows, because our brains love a good shadow. Here are three rivet techniques, because in the 41st millennium, <laughs> they are abundant. Rhinestones make great general purpose rivets for terrain. They're just about the right size, and you get a few thousand of them for a couple of quid. I buy the self-adhesive ones, which are designed to be heat fixed. But as much as I enjoy the smell of burning MDF, I fix them with super glue. The self-adhesive backing has a kind of waffle pattern, which the glue grabs really well, which means they don't fall off if you get a bit enthusiastic with the old dry brush. I, uh, I ran out of space. Ball bearings are fiddly to apply, but they produce a very precise looking rivet. The process is simple. Drill a hole the size of the ball to half the depth of the ball, and then glue them in place. Now, this is time consuming, and I certainly wouldn't do it on a large terrain piece or a mega gargant, but it does look good. Nail art beads are ridiculously cheap. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and they're a must have for kit bashers and scratch builders. For me, they're absolutely perfect for adding some variety to the representations of different fixings on the model. One of the big downsides of flat pack terrain is that curved surfaces tend to look like they're from a 1990s video game. In the case of this TT combat power station I'm building, there are four very unfortunate looking tubes on the front of the building, and they need to go. This is the perfect use case for my favorite kid's construction toy. I get so much mileage out of these delightful little tubes, and if anyone knows a better source for them than Captain Ethical's Dystopia Warehouse, then I'd love to know. If you sealed the surface and filled the gaps in the building, once it's painted, it'll do a more than reasonable job of representing a metal surface. But I wanted the lower half to have more of a concrete vibe. So I made a texture paste from paint, PVA glue and baking soda, roughly in equal proportions, and slapped it over all the bits in the model that I didn't want to look like they were still made of metal. And speaking of metal, I also added some tread plate pattern styrene to all the walkways. By adding these few distinct textural elements, the building looks more visually interesting and less wooden than the delivery of this voiceover. Handrails on laser cut kits suck, they, they just do. But on most of the kits I've encountered, the dimensions for the mounting holes for the handrails are the same as the thickness of the sheet, which, you know, makes sense because the handrails got to fit in the hole. So if you're making new barriers, fences, handrails, whatever, then all you have to do is get some profile, in this case styrene, that's the same as the thickness as the sheet. I decided to make mine quite traditional looking with one millimetre wire handrail, but you could easily fill the gaps between the posts with more styrene for a more sci-fi barricade look. Uh, pretty sure there's another E in Greebles. Never mind. Greebles, greeblies, detail bits, whatever you want to call them, they're the small parts that you attach to the model to help bring it to life and set it in place in the universe. There's really not much technique to this, just use your imagination. To be honest, I'm only really including this little bit here because it'd be strange if a bunch of stuff appeared on the model when I move on to the next section. Since this is a piece of terrain, I'm not going heavy metal, more medium density fiber. You, you get the idea. 
I started by giving everything a coat of black primer, followed by some Vallejo NATO green over most of the building. Obviously you don't need an airbrush to do this, but it does save a truckload of paint on a model this size. And, and, and time, it, it definitely saves time. Then all the metal bits got a coat of gun metal from the Vallejo Model Air range. It's a beautiful paint, as is the non-oil that I indiscriminately slapped over the top of it. Then came the step that everybody knows how to do, so I'm not going to describe it because I, I value your time. Anyway, I finished things up by blending everything in with some weathering. I used this to create some subtle shadows, streaks, dirt deposits, yeah, that kind of thing. Oh, and rust spots. You've got to put rust spots on rivets, otherwise how would people know they're rivets? You might well be thinking, you probably should have based that before you painted it. In a lot of cases, you'd probably have a point, but there are so many overhangs, tight spots, crannies, walkways, reading nooks, etc. I figured life would just be simpler if I had access to the underside for painting. But it did mean I had to be a bit careful with the terrain paste, which well, it came out all right, I think. So there we go. One power station that hopefully hides its laser cut roots. I, I say hopefully because you may notice that I forgot to fill the gaps in the control room, which was a bit of an oversight. I kept putting off gluing on the front to make it easier to paint the inside and, uh, well, I just forgot. So that's a problem for future Chris. Anyway, I hope you found the video useful or perhaps even entertaining. And if you're looking for something else to watch, might I suggest uh, one of these? <laughs>